When I graduated from high school in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 1979, there were still plenty of jobs at places like R.J. Reynolds Tobacco for somebody without a college degree. None of us knew the day this picture was taken that most of those jobs would disappear over the next decade. Many of my friends' lives were ruined because of educational decisions they had to make before the labor market changed. And so it's astonishing that 35 years later, after it's obvious that U.S. students are going to need higher level of skills in order to be able to thrive in this labor market, our schools still don't deliver them. So when you look at the trend in scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress for 17-year-olds, the trend has been flat in reading and there's been a slight increase in math. Now, over the last 35 years, we've had a series of presidents <laughs> who have each pledged to reform U.S. education. Now, we ought to be asking ourselves now, what is it about our educational system that has made it so hard to improve? And we can't blame that on political, we can't blame 35 years of stagnation on our political leaders. We need to be asking, is there some structural issue with our system? And second, what could Harvard do to try to help uh, close that gap? So, um, when you think about um, sectors like healthcare and biotechnology that have seen much more rapid progress over this time period, there are two key differences with education. First, it's clear that we invest far too little in testing new ideas before we implement them. So the National Institute of Health right now is doing six lists 69,000 clinical trials on their website that are underway in the United States. In comparison, the Institute uh, on Education Sciences identifies less than one-tenth that number, studies in education, over the last two decades. But the second thing we're missing is any kind of social network for internalizing those results into the day-to-day -day decisions that school agency leaders and practitioners make every day. So that's actually the reason why I'm wearing this crazy lab coat, um, is I've been trying to think about what are the roles um, that Harvard could play to help try to fill that gap. Now, I, when I directed the Gates Foundation's uh, Measures of Effective uh, teaching project, I learned that it wasn't just about research design, although you'd expect a researcher to talk about, oh, the importance of random assignment and study design. Actually, I think that's a small part of the problem. A bigger part of the problem is the existence of this social network. So in the MET project, we were, I learned that when you work with school agency leaders, um, when you give school agency leaders a chance to ask the question, they're much more likely to listen to the answer. So because we designed and executed that project in collaboration with school districts and state agencies, the project, I think, has had an outsized impact on uh, school policies around the country as it's being applied to the redesign of teacher evaluations in more than 40 states. So we ought to be thinking, what could Harvard do to try to, try to change that? And I think there are four different, uh, five, six different steps we could take. <laughs> oh, I keep adding steps. So first, <laughs> first, Obviously, we'd need to recruit a national network of school agencies. So traditional public schools as well as, um, as charter management organizations that were willing 
to learn with us. Second, we'd have to impanel working groups from those school agencies to develop solutions. Now, we could season those panels with researchers, like our own faculty that are experts in English language learners or um, literacy or math instruction. Um, and third, we could add into these working groups um, experts in educational technology. Now, the need for such a system is most obvious in the case of professional development. So the t two large studies, federally funded studies recently, have suggested that the traditional approach to professional development is ineffective. And yet, despite that, most school districts around the country continue to provide PD in the same ineffective way. So we ought to be having one of these work groups should be thinking about how could we use video technology, for instance, to give teachers a different way of demonstrating that they've learned the skills that they've been taught in these professional development sessions. We have a clinical trial underway right now where we're giving teachers the chance to use video to as a way to do their classroom observations, to submit their own lessons rather than have a principal sh surprise them in class. The third step is um, to mobilize a national network of data analysts. So there is no big education data set that combines the data on students and teachers from around the country. And given the debacle this spring within Bloom, it's very unlikely that there ever will be. So it'll be important to have um, analysts working inside each of the agencies that are doing this who could organize the data and upload only the aggregated results to a central analytic team. Now this is a big lift. Fortunately, our education, our um, uh, center has been working on this. Currently, it's, it's a project called the Strategic Data Project. We currently have 191 um, analysts working in 73 different agencies around the country. So we could mobilize that network and add to it in order to be able to provide a site-based analyst in each of the agencies that were part of the network. Fourth, just like in health, that network could then host clinical trials. When the, when the work groups have developed a solution, we could ask for volunteers within the network to see who wanted to uh, participate. We could hold lotteries and assign um, one group of, of schools to a treatment group, another to a control group, and then again, the site-based analyst could upload the data to a central analytic team. Now, the key thing here is that by doing this year by year, we could um, generate results and build on, our, uh, build on lessons learned um, year after year, each year developing a more refined version of, of the answer. Now, a reasonable person would ask four questions. Like, first, why now? Well, there are two main reasons. First, that now with the coming of the Common Core assessments, it's possible for the first time for, to, met, to compare the achievement growth in a Massachusetts school to growth in a, in a comparable school in New Mexico. Second is, after uh, developments in recent years in educational software, there's a new set of educational software tools that are just waiting to be tested. The second question somebody might ask is why, why Harvard? And I think there are three reasons. One, we have the convening power. Few, uh, school di few other institutions around the country would have it. Second, we have the strategic data project. We've already got a network of data analysts out there working in, in school districts. And third, we have experts in many of these areas English language learning, literacy, math, instruction, and so forth. They could work with the working groups to develop solutions. 
Won't this just add to the churn of initiatives? I'm, I'm really close. Actually, um, uh, no, because part, the reason for that churn is that there is no evidence, and so leaders are constantly recycling old ideas. Now, in closing, <laughs> it's clear that our education system needs to find a way to be able to develop and test ideas more rapidly. It's clear that Harvard could play a major role in helping to do that. It would have an historic impact. And if we don't do it, I have no idea who would. Thank you.